Hello! So a couple of days ago I was in a bookstore, a used bookstore with my kiddos, and I was helping my son pick out a new chapter book to bring home and to read, and I found Anna and the French Kiss chilling in the uh, elementary kids section. So I took a picture of it, put it on my Discord, I was like, hey, hey, do you think this would be good for my kids? It was a joke because I hate that book. And um, a couple of my patrons were uh, joking about wanting to see that old rant again and how like it's gone now. So I thought, you know, maybe, maybe that's what we could do today. Cause I do have quite a few, you know, I've been on, I've been making booktube videos for like eight years now. And uh, so there are a lot of old videos that are now privated because you know, your old self didn't, you, you wouldn't listen to her. She didn't know what she was talking about. But I guess today we're gonna listen to her. Um, so thankfully I have a friend who keeps a spreadsheet of all of the books that I read and all of the videos attached to those books, even if those videos are privated. So I'm just gonna go through the spreadsheet and we are going to watch clips from some of my old videos um, and just like, just revisit some old rants. I'm not sure why. I, you know what? I am sure why. The reason I wanted to do this was because I don't rant a lot on my channel and a lot of the old ones are gone. So I thought, hey, let's revisit Old Murphy. But before we get into all of that, a shout out to today's sponsor, Skillshare. I might have mentioned once, twice, or I don't know, a dozen times lately about how chaotic my life has been lately, how busy things have been lately, and that has changed a lot of things for me. And one thing that I have been really interested in working on is my productivity because lately every minute of my day counts and managing that day counts and that's not a strong suit of mine. And Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of classes led by industry experts across film, illustration, design, freelance, productivity, and more. Skillshare can help you take your career, skills, hobbies, passions, or side hustles to the next level. Whether your interest is in film, illustration, painting, animation, design, they have classes for so many interests and passions. Plus, they have smarter class categories, three new class topics, creative careers, creative inspiration, and AI and innovation, and the ability to find classes by software and material. The class that I just started is called Productivity Masterclass, Principles and Tools to Boost Your Productivity by Ali Abdal. But regardless of what your interests are, they have so many classes available. New members can share what some of their interests are and then Skillshare can automatically recommend classes that will fit your goals better. The first 500 people to use the link in my description will get one month free of Skillshare, so be sure to check that out today. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and thank you to you for checking them out. Okay, Anna and the French Kiss. Uh, why did I hate this book so much? Um, Anna moves to France. She's like a film nerd. She She's seen every film. She loves cinema. And uh, she moves to France and she's like, what? They love film here? And then she falls in love with a boy who um, has a girlfriend. And she like has these really violent thoughts where she thinks about like ripping her hair out and stuff. It's so cute and romantic. And then um, they cheat. And I hated it because <laughs> it was not romantic. I'll find the clip. I'll play it. But oh boy, this, this book. I hated this book. I gave it zero stars because I didn't even think that it deserved one star. Etienne was horrible. There's, there's definitely no debate about that. Um, he was with a girl in a solid relationship and then he met Anna and then he decided I don't like my relationship anymore and I want out. That's for real. Don't cut, try to correct me. He even tells Anna in the end that things were good until she showed up and then he realized that he wanted out of that relationship. Here's the problem. He didn't want to get out of it. He just wanted out. <laughs> and so instead of breaking up with his girlfriend and then pursuing Anna, he decided to skip that first step and just pursue Anna. That would be bad enough, except that he actually does end up cheating on said girlfriend with Anna by making out with her and groping her in public. Excellent way to handle that. But then at the end of the book, when everything blows up, because of course it will, he tries to blame Anna a little bit. Actually, let me see if I can find the part. Yeah, here we go. All right. Um. So he even admits, I cheated on her every day. In my mind, I thought of you in ways I shouldn't have again and again. She was nothing compared to you. I've never felt this way about anybody before. 
Then he continues on with his monologue that's really stupid. He starts talking about how she should have picked up on his love for her. Um, I bought you love poetry. I start a passage. Why didn't you open it? Um, she said, because you, because it was for school. He said, I said you were beautiful. I slept in your bed. She said, you never made a move. You had a girlfriend. He said, no matter what a terrible boyfriend I was. Oh wait, we'll, we'll stop there. So he's like telling her, like, these are all the random abstract hints I dropped. How did you not get it? I'm trying to make it her fault that like, things didn't go the way they should have. Like she should have picked up on it. Then she should have told him that she liked him. Then he could have broken up with his girlfriend. Boy, no. Then he continues, no matter what a terrible boyfriend I was, I wouldn't have cheated on her. But I thought you'd know. With me being there, I thought you'd know. So that's his response to her saying, of course I didn't pick up on your hints. You had a girlfriend the whole time. And he says, no matter what I did in my mind, I never would have actually cheated on her. Boy, you just made out and groped her in public. She also has these really strange, disturbing thoughts, thinking about like ripping the girl's hair out and keeping a tally of like who spends more time with him. And like, she has these weird internal thoughts that are very uncomfortable. And uh, the girlfriend's a really pleasant, sweet, trusting, kind girl, but she's villainized because you know, she's gonna be cheated on. But we should like the main character. I don't know, man, I, I didn't like it. Oh no, oh no, okay. I forgot that I hated Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens so aggressively. I've begun reading classics. I've discovered many classic books that I love. I discovered Peter Pan, which was a very meaningful book for me, I have a spoiler review and I loved it so much. Um, but then there was the prequel, Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens, and I hated it so much. Like, I think it was my least favorite book of all time for a minute there. And I don't know that it was deserved, if I'm gonna be honest with you, because at the time, I don't think I was reading tragedies. And Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens, there's one scene in particular that is just like, it's so sad. It is so aggressively sad. I remember just crying and crying while reading this book and I was so mad at it for how it made me feel. And I don't know that that's the kind of reaction I would have today. I wonder if it's time for me to do a reread of Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens. Isn't it funny that for a period of time, Peter Pan was my all-time favorite book and Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens was my all-time least favorite book? Like, <laughs> that contrast. Maybe it's time for me to go back through Peter Pan and Kensington Gardens, because I promised I would never read it again. But I, I might, I might need to change that. A clip from the wrap-up where I talked about it. So not only was this book boring and Peter Pan was barely in it and the Peter Pan that we knew was barely Peter Pan, like it wasn't the same Peter Pan and it didn't have the same kind of whimsy and it just it was just so different not only all of that but the ending was like a freaking punch to my heart not in a good way like I like a little bit of tragedy to my ending but I felt like this ending was just like J.M. Barry wanting to cause me pain for no good reason it was like it was like the saddest thing I could have read and then Bye. Just like, mm. <gasps> One True Loves. <gasps> I hated this book so much. They can't find the body and he's pronounced dead. She spends three and a half years mourning his life and then she falls in love again and she's engaged and she's about to be married. And right before she gets married, then her long lost husband shows up and he's like, hey, I'm not dead. And I got off the island just to get back to you. All I'll say is that the protagonist was the most selfish person I've read about in a really long time. In her internal monologue, she says, okay, if I have sex with Jesse, then this will forever change what happens with me and Sam. And she's like, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have sex with Jesse anyway. So they have sex a couple times as well. Then they decide that they should actually spend some time together and get to know each other. They're on a three day trip but she breaks up with him on day two. And the reason she does is because, okay, her internal monologue drove me nuts because it was stuff like he bought them a pizza to share and then he got some Diet Coke and he and he's like, if I know my Emma, you can't stay in a house without some Diet Coke waiting for her. And in her mind, she's like, I don't drink Diet Coke anymore. He doesn't know that I don't eat cheese anymore. And so 
all the time that they're spending together over this, well, two days before she breaks up with him, all this time that they spend together is completely wrapped around this internal monologue that she keeps having where she keeps saying, he doesn't know that I like cats now. He doesn't understand that I don't like cheese. He doesn't like my pixie cut. It's just, it's all this stuff about like, I've changed, but he wants to treat me like I'm the same. Which granted, he really doesn't make any effort to get to know the new Emma that has progressed in three and a half years. But I feel like that's reasonably understandable. He has some serious PTSD and he's clinging to the one thing that he's been fighting for and he's treating her like old Emma because that's the Emma that he knows and loves. I feel like it's reasonable that he doesn't immediately say, hey, do you like Diet Coke now? And the thing is that all the things all the things that have changed about her are all so surface level. Who cares that you don't eat cheese anymore? And she's constantly comparing the two. She's constantly like, Sam knows I don't eat cheese anymore. Sam knows I like cats now. Anyway, after they go through all this and after she breaks up with him two days into their three day trip, they then decide, let's just pretend like we're not broken up and let's enjoy this last day together so they, you know, have sex some more. After she's decided she's going back to Sam, <laughs> she stays with Jesse a little bit longer just because why not? Anyway, she then goes running back to Sam to tell him that she's chosen him and she's afraid that he won't take her back and basically Sam cuts her off and he's like listen I, I changed my mind I don't want you I don't want to give you time to make the decision for yourself I need you we need to be together I love you forever and she's like oh good because I've decided that I love you too and she says but I did go on a three-day trip with Jesse and Sam's like no no no, I don't want to hear about it it doesn't matter what you did let's be together forever so they're ha they live happily ever after they get married Jesse goes to live in California and then he calls her later and says, hey, I've fallen in love with someone else. I get it now. I didn't get it at the time, but I get it now and I'm happy for you. And that's how that one ends. Okay, that's a wrap on 2018. <laughs> Golly gee willikers, how, how long have I been just talking about books? Murphy. <gasps> the Duke and I. Oh no! The Duke and I was given to me by a friend who said, you don't like romance, but try this one. And oh my goodness, like what? <laughs> Bridgerton's has since gotten a TV adaptation. I haven't watched it, but oh no. Um, all right, sure. Here you go. Here's a clip. This is a story about two people, Daphne and Simon. They end up being in a relationship of circumstances. He wants to be less desirable and left alone by all the mothers who want to marry him off to his daughter to their daughters and so he decides to be in a fake relationship she wants to be more desirable and he convinces her that by being mildly taken suddenly the guys are gonna want you so they fake date here's why it sucked because daphne knows nothing about sex the duke and daphne continue on with their relationship and it's ex it's basically explained that the duke pulls out when they have sex she often thinks to herself huh that's funny wonder why he does that Oh well, guess this is how you have sex. Until somebody makes a comment and then she realizes, hang on, this isn't normal. She puts two and two together and realizes the man is intentionally not getting her pregnant. Simon takes advantage of Daphne's ignorance a lot. He does not communicate with her. But let's talk about Daphne some more because somehow she manages to suck worse than the Duke. They get into a big argument, he leaves, gets drunk, comes home, falls asleep next to her. She wakes up in the middle of the night. She specifically thinks to herself, did I take advantage of him? Yeah. Do I feel bad about it? No. This might be the only way I could get pregnant. I'm actually pretty happy by what I did. She says she's pregnant, sends him a letter. He receives the letter and decides to come home. When he comes home, he's mad at her for horseback riding and he's like, hey, you, you're gonna lose the baby this way. And she's mad at him because she just had her period and it turns out she was just late and not pregnant. They finally talk it out. He explains why he doesn't want children. She says his explanation is stupid. He decides maybe he kind of wants a baby. And she says, I thought you were mad at me for what I did. He says, I didn't like what you did. Please don't do that again. But that's not why I was mad. I was actually just mad because I started stuttering and I was embarrassed by my stutter, so I bailed. They then make up, he works through his issues, they have a baby, and live happily ever after. This isn't supposed to be a book with perfect people having perfect actions. These characters are supposed to be flawed, but it's also supposed to be romantic. And in my opinion, there was nothing romantic about this book at all. On to 2020. The storied life of A.J. Fickery <laughs> was, was a book that gave me some severe whiplash because I loved it and it was like, this is gonna be a new favorite book, this is five stars, calling it now. I'm gonna read everything by this author, I love it so much. And then it's like, <laughs> I hated the ending so much. Is that the big twist, um, the, in order to make this work, the author had to jump through such ridiculous 
hoops of like this character took this thing and then they couldn't sell it so they hid away in the closet for a while and then this other character who happened to be there saw it one time but then didn't mention it for a long time until the exact right moment and then once it was the right moment then they mentioned it to the other character and they were like hey I know you have it and so then they con they win they did the thing and then uh, that way it could be given back to the man at the exact right time and it was just like I'm trying to say it fast I'm trying to say it vague because I don't want to spoil but it was the most ridiculous, convoluted, like a million different tiny steps that happened at the exact right time that people made the exact right decision so that it could all come back at the exact right time. And it was like, it was so ridiculous. Okay, I don't see, um, which admittedly I've started going through these a little bit faster now. I don't see any other um, one star reviews. I think 2020 was around the year that I started DNFing more books because I, you know, if you don't like something, you, you can stop. It is an option. In case you didn't know, it is an option. So I started um, doing that more. <laughs> so there's probably going to be fewer rants moving forward, which is good because this video has got to be forever long already. So 2021, Kafka on the Shore was a time to be alive. Kafka on the Shore, so I'll be clear, I read one Murakami before this and I enjoyed it. And then I read Kafka on the Shore and <laughs> I read it with a group of friends and we all um, ha didn't like it. And it was a wild ride, I will say that. Um, I don't think Murakami is the author for me, even though I did enjoy Sputnik Sweetheart. Um, I still had some mixed feelings about it, and Kafka on the Shore was like, oh, all those things you feel mixed about, let's just, like, shoot them through the stratosphere. And I, um, here's a clip from the review. It, it's kind of, this, this entire book is kind of a mix between very, very detailed day-to-day -day scenes and incest descriptions of how long Nakata was sleeping and Oshima describing every single thing that he did while Nakata was sleeping and then coming back and then Nakata wakes up and then Oshima explaining those things again to Nakata this time instead of to the reader this time and then going on a really long analogy about what this really long sleep was like. I mean it just there was just so much um nothing. The scene where Johnny Walker very graphically and brutally uh, dissects living cats while they're still alive, I just said that, and then eats their still beating hearts so that he can use their souls to power his special flute. Women spontaneously have periods when they're aroused and I don't understand why. At one point Kafka has some water and feels his <laughs> absorb it. I'll be clear, fans of Murakami were in the comments of that video letting me know like you just did not get the point of this of this book and honestly I probably didn't <laughs> like truthfully you're probably right because I came away from that book just like but why so hey maybe that one's on me maybe that one is aggressively and totally on me but Whew, that book was a uh, it was a ride. Okay, I don't see any more from 2021. So 2022. Oh, right. The first book I read that year that wasn't like um, the first novel I read that year was a dud. Uh, this close to okay. I really wanted to love that book. I really thought I would. I felt so confident about it. And um, just like some weird the the main the main two characters he was going through a lot of stuff and she was a licensed therapist and she kept calling herself his unofficial therapist as they were starting this relationship and as she's like psychoanalyzing him while they're in a relationship this close to okay um the setup of this book we follow two characters one's name is tally she's a licensed therapist and then one whose name isn't revealed until a little bit she in her mind calls him bridge the reason she calls him Bridge is because this book opens with him getting ready to jump off a bridge and she stops to talk him down. Throughout this book, Tally, in her perspective, has these italicized thoughts over and over and over again throughout the entire book where she calls herself her, his unofficial therapist and she has these thoughts like patient copes in this way, patient is inherently kind, patient this, that, and that. And she's, she's treating him in her mind like a patient and she's trying to assess and diagnose him throughout every encounter they have. Did I mention this is a romance? 
Oh, and did I also mention that she never tells him that she's a licensed therapist or that she considers him her unofficial patient? She omits all that information, makes up a fake career for herself, and develops this relationship with this fella. But don't worry, he's horrible too. He also makes terrible choices that affect her life in very significant ways and keeps those things from her while entering into this relationship. So just in general, we're having a great time with two people who are very bad at this relationship. The nitpick I have that bothered me throughout this whole book is the writing style. Uh, I'll read to you a couple of lines. He never drank wine anymore. It silked down his throat like a ribbon. She flinched, her words clomping out with sticky boots. She was buzzed like him. They were two tiny bees touching antennae, buzzing. He wrapped his hand around hers, the pales of the wrist kissed. Tally counted to three. He put up a decent fight. My pleasure, he said, modest as fresh cut green grass. He and Tally finished their plump little beers. <gasps> Survive the night! That was another one, that same friend group that we read, um, Kafka on the Shore. We read Survive the Night together as well! Okay, so Charlie, um, there's this campus killer on her college campus who is picking off girls and killing them. And uh, Charlie's roommate was one of those girls. And uh, Charlie is devastated. She's obviously like that, that, that affected her. She decides that she needs to go, she needs to travel from point A to point B and it's going to be a long car trip. She must leave now. She can't wait on her boyfriend, Robbie. So, in, so in, she decides to go to the bulletin board where somebody posts, a man posts that he is traveling in that direction and you know, carpool. And so she agrees upon it agrees to it. Already we have a campus killer who's picking off girls and she decides to get into the car with a stranger. Immediate red flags where he's answering questions wrong and revealing that he's not actually, he doesn't belong on this campus, he's not actually a student. She asks him questions and she trips him up and catches him in lies and she still gets into the car with him and I don't know, man. Anyway, we're in her head and in her head she's saying, I'm gonna be extra cautious, I'm gonna be extra careful. I have to be, I have to be like a maiden in a, in a movie. Oh my goodness, this girl likes movies. I have to be like the girls in the movies who are strong and brave and cunning and, and I don't remember all the adjectives she used, but she described the girls in the movies that she wants to be like, and she's gonna be like them too, and she's going to be on her toes. She repeat just over and over and over again, she tells us that she is aware of her surroundings and she's making good choices as she continues to make bad choices, like getting in the dang car with the guy. Or when she's like, maybe I should have checked his license plate to see if it was even a, a license plate for this state. Didn't do that. Anyway, this is one of those rare books where it's terribly boring and then whenever things start happening, it gets worse. <laughs> My friends and I, we were reading this together, we were discussing it at the end of every chapter, and we were throwing out these comedically bad potential endings, just like laughing, what if the book went here? And that is how it went. And then for 2023, <laughs> I have a couple of books that were like little duds, but um, nothing that was extreme, except for a book that I bought for my niece. She wanted me to get her some cute romance books for Christmas. And so I got her, I think three books and agreed to read them with her so that we could talk about them. And the first book we picked up was Kisses and Croissants. <laughs> I hated that book so much. <laughs> I hated it so much. And it's not because it was for teens and I'm not a teen. It was because it was toxic, cheap, unnecessary drama. Not even in the realm of miscommunication or, oh, I heard a rumor about you or I jumped to a conclusion. We're talking about something completely external that didn't fit in the book that was so stupid. Not only that, but Mia was insufferable. She was the most selfish character without the narrative ever actually pointing to the fact that she was so selfish. Throughout the entire book, she lies to all of her friends that are at this program with her as she's like, ah, I have a romance, but I don't want them to know because I don't want them to judge me and I don't want them to know who I'm having a romance with because then they'll think that I'm getting preferential treatment so I just won't tell anyone. And Fair enough, your concerns are valid, but you don't have to outright lie about everything. You could just say, yes, I'm not hanging out with you today because I'm going on a date. I have a little Paris romance going on on the side. I'm not gonna talk to you about it though because it's my private life. Let 
this part I'm keeping personal. But instead of teaching young readers that communication is a great thing and setting boundaries is something that we're capable of doing, instead she just lies through her teeth throughout the entire book with no consequences. None of her friends ever get mad at her, even when she's found out. They just don't care. They repeatedly are suspicious that she's lying and kind of try to gently call her out and she just digs her heels in and lies harder. Nothing ever comes of that. They all are just like, Apparently it's cool what she's doing. That's totally fine. But then also Louis, she treats horribly. <laughs> she m twice left him in the middle of a date. Well, once it was in the middle of a date and once it was during a social occasion that I don't think was technically a date. But anyway, one in particular that was their first official date and they were having a lovely time and it was really sweet. And then her friends showed up by coincidence and she just left. He answered a call. She saw her friends and she was like, <laughs> Bye. Like, she didn't even say bye to him. She just walked off with her friends. She went home with her friends. She was like, I'll text him later about it. And narratively, it was just mentioned in a sentence a chapter or two later where she was just like, yeah, I told him and he was totally fine with it. Like, it was never, there was no conversation of, hey, you kind of make me feel valueless when you do these things to me. Like, I'm cool with keeping a relationship a secret, but you not even considering me and just leaving without talking to me makes me feel bad. Or you running off repeatedly and always making a relationship about you doesn't feel super nice. Or anytime you get an inkling about my past or about something that may, may paint me in a negative light, you just lash out at me and make everything stupid drama for no reason, you could maybe talk to me. You could maybe communicate with me. I could maybe explain things to you. There's no conversation around any of Mia's really selfish actions throughout the entire book, except for people apologizing to her. People repeatedly apologize to her. People repeatedly are like, yeah, I'm sorry that I made, that you felt, that I made, I made you feel this way, but you totally misunderstood the situation, so let's talk it out. Like, but she doesn't apologize. The only apology that she gives in the entire book was to entirely selfish. Throughout a whole book full of her being really selfish, constantly treating other people as if they hold no value in the story. I mean, she is the most main character syndrome, main character I've ever seen, where everything revolves around her. She doesn't consider anyone else's feelings. None of her actions are determined by how they may affect other people. And the world just bends around her and everybody's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you were put in a hard position. I don't need an apology from you. So the one apology that she actually gives in this book, she says, I didn't want to leave Paris knowing someone hated me. That was the apology. It was, I'm sorry, I wanted to address this because of how this, com because of how this could have affected me. And again, this year, once again, I have been DNFing books over the last few years. I don't usually push through books I hate unless I have a really good reason. Like I'm reading it with my niece and I'm, I'm supposed to discuss it with her. Um, <laughs> Poor niece, man. <laughs> she actually, she didn't hate kisses and croissants. She didn't like it, but she, well, she had to listen to me. Anyway, the only book that I did complete despite hating it, well, two books actually. One was uh, A Court of Mist and Fury, which I didn't really take notes on that book, so I don't feel like the commentary I had for it was really very good. I just kind of like read it, didn't like it, and then had a chat with Amber Elise about it, and I generally couldn't I couldn't fully express in detail why the book was just like, <laughs> just did not work for me. But then we buddy read Bride together. And that time I was like, I'm coming with notes. I'm going to have my reasons. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this. And we did a whole live stream and it was so much fun. But I also talked about it in a wrap up so I can um, clip that real quick too. There were several other books in this lineup that got low ratings from me and that I definitely had some more harsh reviews for in wrap-ups or in reading vlogs, but I went for like the rant books, the books that were just, oh my goodness, hated. And I'm sure the video was plenty long enough just focusing on those because I have been talking for many years. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do chat with me more in the comments if you feel like it. I hope you enjoyed taking a walk down memory lane of Angry Murphy. I'm not sure, why did I do this again? <laughs> anyway, I'll see you again soon. Bye.